Hey y'all, in this video we're going to discuss the steps that I took to design and calculate the tool paths needed to create this clock in the shape of the state of Oregon. We're going to do this in Aspire version 10.507, but everything I'm going to show you works identically in vCarve Desktop and vCarve Pro. My main reason for making this video is to show you some of the things you're going to have to take into consideration when you're first coming up with the design for your clock. Now I have a few photos here that I'll show you that will kind of give you an idea as to what I mean. First of all, there are different types of clock movements. We have the insert type. This is fully self-contained. The hands, the movement, the dial are already made for you, and it comes in a sealed package. You mill out a opening to insert the entire clock face, and you're done. The next type is the type we're most familiar with, and that is the battery operated movement pack that has separate hands and the correct fasteners and spacers needed to attach those hands on the front of the face of the clock. Now, both types of clock movement require a little bit of attention, and the best bet is to secure that movement, have it in your hand so you can take certain measurements from the clock movement itself, be it this case type or the insert type. You will need those measurements in order to complete your design and make sure everything fits. The case itself is pretty self-explanatory, but you will need to know the thickness of the case, its height, in X and its width in Y. That is so you can pocket out the back of your material to recess the case of the movement into your material. Also what needs to be taken into consideration is the shaft length and diameter. Add in, you'll need to know which size hands to get. Now, I've put a link in the description box of this video to a blog article by a company called ClockKit. They make and sell various different types of movements, some that come with hands, some that come separate from hands. Some are battery operated, some are wind up. They also have inserts. I've also included a couple of sources of movements that I have used in the past that have worked out well for me. You'll find all those links down in the description box of this video. In that blog article over at ClockKit, they discuss the easiest way to decide the size of hands you will need for your clock. And that is a determining factor in our design. For instance, if we look at this image here, down here at the bottom, we see that the measurement from the center line of the hand hub, where it attaches onto the shaft of the clock, the measurement from the center of that hole to the tip of the hand is 4.33 inches, or 110 millimeters. The general rule of thumb is the hand can be up to a quarter of an inch oversize or a quarter of an inch undersize and still look correct. So what we're looking at here is a space between the center hub here and an outer diameter of our clock face somewhere between four and four and a half inches to use this hand. This hand would be the correct size for our project. 
Now, if I go back over here to the design I have already drawn up, I have my layout complete here to carve my wall clock. I'm going to come over here under Edit Objects to my Measure tool. And the measurement I want to watch up here is distance. I'll come down here to the center of the hole that I have drawn out for the clock movement shaft to come through. And I'll click. And because of the sh shape of the state of Oregon, it has this dip down here. So this is going to be the shortest part of this drawing. So I'm just going to come up here to the middle. And I'm going to follow this outline, keeping my eye over there on distance, right up here. And I see right now I'm at 3.89 inches. And I'll kind of move it along and follow this line and find the smallest number. Okay, it's getting, it's increasing here. I'll come back down to about here and I see... 3.7707 inches is the shortest distance between the edge of my cutout here and the center of the hub of my clock movement. So I would want something, I would want hands that were shorter than three and three quarter inches long if I didn't want those hands to extend past the top of my piece of material here when I cut this out. So in, basically my point is to keep those hands in proportion to the rest of the clock, I would want hands that were less than three and three quarter inches long. So what I would be looking for if I wanted to maintain that quarter inch tolerance is hands somewhere between three and a half inches long and three and three quarter inches long. I'll press escape to get out of my measure tool and we'll go back here to my pictures. So this set of hands here would be too long for this particular clock. I would want something between three and a half inches long and three and three quarter inches long. And remember, again, we are talking about the sp distance between the center of the mounting hole and the tip of the hand. With this thin blade here, I can trim this down. I just don't know if I could trim it down a full inch. So I would probably want to shop a different movement with a different set of hands. Another thing to take into consideration is the shaft diameter down here. Now, these, this section of the shaft doesn't really concern us all that much. It is important, but the diameter isn't that important to us. What we're concerned with is this diameter right here, and in this case, it's 0.31 inch. We're going to need this dimension here, this diameter, in order to know what size hole we need right here. I hesitate to say it's a standard size, but the majority of clock movements I have purchased and used in the past, this hole is 5 sixteenths of an inch in diameter. That's not always the case, but it's another example of how you should really have the movement you're going to use for the project in hand before you design your clock so you know what size hole to use here. Now I'm going to switch over to the bottom side of this project to show you that another consideration is the size of the pocket that we're going to mill in the back of this project and any radius for the corners that we may need. Again, you will want to have that movement in hand so you can physically measure the movement and size the pocket accordingly. Another thing to consider is the depth of this pocket. Now, in my case, the pocket depth is one half inch. If I come back over to my photos and go back over here, 
this case is a little more than a half of an inch thick. So the entire case would not recess down into that pocket. I would have to increase the depth of that pocket to make this sit flush with the back of my piece of material. That's something to consider depending upon how you intend to mount this clock to the wall. If you're going to use a keyhole, this case should sit flush with the back of the material. It can protrude a little bit because you can adjust how much of the screw you're going to drive into the wall to mount the clock with is sticking out of the wall. But you would like to have the clock sit as flush to the wall as possible. So for this case being 0.65 inches thick, I would have to increase the depth of my pocket here. So that's another thing to take into consideration. The physical width, height, and thickness of the movement. Going back over to the pictures here, we've discussed the diameter of the shaft hole that you'll need to mill. Another dimension that needs to be paid attention to is the total shaft length. Now, these clock movements come with varying shaft lengths depending upon the thickness of the material you're using. The thread length is important and the total shaft length is important. You don't want the hands sticking out an inch in front of your clock face and you want enough thread length coming through the front of the clock face for you to secure it down with the nut that attaches the movement to the clock face. So again, there are a lot of variables to take into consideration. If we come back over to Aspire, if we look at the thickness of the movement I'm illustrating in this demonstration, it has a thickness of 0.65 inches. That means this pocket's going to be milled 0.65 inches deep to get it to sit flush with the back of the material. That is going to, only going to give me a hundred thousandths of an inch of material if my material is three quarters of an inch thick. So I would have less than an eighth of an inch of top surface here left over after I machine out this pocket on the back. So I will need to make sure that this thread length is long enough to come all the way through that less than an eighth of an inch of material without going too far. Now again, these clock movements come in various sizes with various shaft lengths and with various shaft diameters. So again, if we look at this one here as our example, the thread length on the shaft is a little more than a quarter of an inch. So even if I have to mill this down 0.65 inches deep, I would still have a hundred thousandths of an inch of material that this shaft had to go through, and that would be enough thread length to put the nut on here and fasten it down. So let me reiterate the fact that when you're designing a clock, it's okay to come up with a design and an idea, but before you carve anything, get the movement in your hand and take those measurements. Now, when it comes to an insert, there's another factor to take into account, and that is not only the mounting depth of the insert, but the mounting diameter of the insert. 
these are generally speaking designed to be inserted in thicker materials. They can be used on three-quarter inch material, but generally speaking, these are made for thicker clocks that will sit on a mantle or on a shelf. You'll have an outer ring diameter, and you will have a mounting diameter. The hole that you are going to pocket into your material should be the mounting diameter. They come, generally speaking, with a rubber band type of gasket that wraps around the movement, and these little fingers on this rubber band collapse down and hold the movement snug inside the uh, clock face opening but still allow you to remove that insert when it's time to change the time or replace a battery. Generally speaking, these are the easiest of the two. You can figure out a overall face diameter that you want to use in your clock, then find the mounting diameter and the mounting depth and mill the pocket accordingly. But all of the thinking has been done for you. You don't have to worry about hands. You don't have to worry about a face or a dial or what type of font you're going to use to carve. All of that has been done for you. So, those are some of the variables you will need to look out for when you go to design a simple clock. Again, I have links to these examples down in the description box as well as a link to Clock Kit's blog article that explains how they size hands to fit a clock. But for us, right now, let's go ahead and get into Aspire and let's design that clock. I'm going to start off by going into my job setup, and this is a double sided project. I'll be using a piece of material that is 16 inches wide in X, 11 and a quarter inches tall in Y, and with a nominal thickness of three quarters of an inch. In my double sided projects, as with most of my projects, I set my Z0 to the material surface, and for layout purposes, I set my XY datum to the center. When I flip this project over outside on the CNC router, I plan on flipping it left to right, side to side. And since I'm not doing any 3D models, I'll go ahead and uh, accept these. It, they don't really matter. Hey, the first thing I want to do is I want to import the DXF file I'm going to use for my outline. So I'll come down to Import Vectors, and I will navigate to the folder that has all of my DXF files with my state outlines. This folder, 50 State DXF Files, is available on my website, marklindsaycnc.com, in my shop. And I've put a link to that in the description box below. It's a digital download with all 50 states and the District of Columbia in one zip file. Again, that's available in my shop at marklindsaycnc.com. So, I'll double-click my State of Oregon DXF file. And I'm going to size that up. So let's see, my width is 12. I want to make that 14. And I'll apply that. Close it. Hit F9 to center it. So the first thing I'll want to do is I'll want to draw my dowel holes over here and over here to help me facilitate uh, location when I flip this part over on the CNC. So we'll go up here to draw a circle and I want quarter inch diameter and I'll put one about right here and another one about right here. I use an asymmetrical pattern so I can't get it wrong. There is only one way that 
this material is going to fit when I go to flip it over. I can't make a mistake. And I'll go ahead and select both of those and group them. Then immediately right click, copy to other side. So that when I go to the bottom, my dowel holes are mirrored to the other side. These holes will be used to drill the locating holes in the top of my spoil board. So let's go back to the front here. I am going to import a little bit of text here. So I will go import vectors. And I've decided just to spell out the name Oregon. And let me go ahead and drag that down just a little bit. And that gets it a little bit further down so it's not in the way of the clock face. Now I'm going to select that text, group it. Then I want to select my state outline, go into Align Objects, and I want to align it horizontal with the center of the state outline. Click it and we have centered up on it. I'll close that. Now I want to set up the hole for the shaft of my clock movement and that is five sixteenths of an inch. I don't remember off the top of my head what five sixteenths is in decimal so I'll type in five sixteenths then tap the equals button on my keyboard and there I get the decimal equivalent and I'm going to put that right here I'll close this that is the front I have all of the illustrations I need to carve the front of my clock so now let's go over to the bottom side what I need to do now is get in here and draw a vector, a rectangle, in the center of my material based off of this hole here for the shaft of the clock face to go through. Now again I'll need to check my clock movement and make certain that this shaft is located in the center of this movement vertically and horizontally. In this case, it is. Not all of them are. Some of them, the shaft is up above center slightly. So that's something else to watch out for. This is 2.2 inches by 2.2 inches by 0.65 deep. So we'll go in here and we'll make the width 2.2 three I want just a little bit oversize and 2.3 that will help me get that movement in and out of that pocket we don't want to press fit we want it to be big enough so that the movement will go in there without a lot of force I'm going to estimate quarter inch radius on these the radius corners on that movement are not they're not super huge a quarter inch radius will give me enough of a corner radius that it'll clear and I wanted the center point of this rectangle anchored on my x0 y0 we'll create that close this what I'm going to need to do now is start thinking about the order of operations. What side of this project do I want to cut first? I've already said that these are the mounting holes for the dowels. These will go in the top of the material. This is the top of my material. I've got my text, I've got my mounting hole, and I've got my outline. That tells me that with this being the top of the material and these are the alignment holes for when I flip the material over, this is going to be cut first. So what I need to do 
is I need to transfer this state outline to the back of the material. So I will copy to other side. This is going to be carved first. I'll need to do my profile cutout on the bottom of the material. So I will mill my dowel holes into my spoil board. I'll then pocket out the recess for the movement. Then I can come along and cut out the state outline. So the profile cutout will always be the last thing I do. So let's go over here and calculate some tool paths. We'll start at the top since that's what we're going to cut out first. First thing I'll do is select my text and I'll do a V carve tool path with that. I'm going to carve to a flat depth of 0.1 and I think I want to use yeah I think I'll go ahead and use the 60 degree V bit I may change that I don't know it's going to just carve this little pinstripe here so I I won't use a clearance tool and I'll call this V carve text I'll calculate it And I'll change the toolpath color to black so that you can see it. And we'll preview that toolpath. And I think a 60 degree V bit is just fine. I've got a little bit of width. I don't have to go super deep. It's only carving, carving not quite 30 thousandths. I might want to rethink that. Let me go ahead and undo that. And I will choose a 30 degree V bit and we'll see how that works. Go ahead and preview that. And it's going to appear the same, but my depth, yes, I've gone 61 thousandths deep. I might want to uh, rethink this design, but I think 61 thousandths for this little outline is just fine. It's still a little bit shallow for my tastes, but I don't run the risk of sanding this detail out, especially if I sand it before I do the carving. Then I'll only have a little bit of touch-up sanding to do. So let's go ahead and zoom back out to a straight Z view. Now we'll come over here and we'll pocket all of these holes and I'm not yeah I'm going to use a quarter inch end mill and I only want to go about a half of an inch deep we'll go ahead and use offset pockets and we'll do uh, no and calculate and I will go ahead and leave that the second operation here. And we'll preview that toolpath. And there are our holes. These are the toolpaths we need for the top of our project. So we'll close this and go back into the 2D view. We'll switch over to the bottom. And the first thing I want to do is I want to pocket these two holes in the spoil board. So I will call this pocket dowel holes in caps. in spoil board. That's a note to myself. I'll calculate them. Boy, I spelled dowel really well, didn't I? I'll fix that. Okay, that's better. From there I can close 
my preview. I'm not going to preview those dowel holes as they will not be cut into the material. They will be cut into the spoil board. Now I will select the pocket and we'll do a pocket tool path. I need to remember to go it's my movement is 0.65 I'm gonna go 0.66 and use a quarter inch end mill and we'll go ahead and just call that pocket there's only one pocket on this we'll calculate preview and we have machined down so that the hole from the front side is exposed and that has taken us down if you look down at my readout down here that's taken us down to 0.66 now all that's left to do is my profile cutout and that will be done because I'm machining the bottom of the material. I will want the front surface to look as nice as I can get it. In this case, I'll need to remember to use an upcut bit. It may splinter the back, but I can live with that. I don't want the bit to splinter the front. So, with this vector selected, do a profile tool path. I want it to go through the material by five thousandths of an inch. So up here in my cut depth, I'll type Z plus 0 0.005, then tap the equals button, and that gives me my cut depth. I want to use a quarter inch end mill, and I want to cut outside the vectors. Climb cut. I want to do a separate last pass with an allowance of 0.1. I am going to add tabs. Let's put one right here. Uh, we'll go with one here, one here, one here. You'll notice I'm trying to avoid curves wherever possible. That makes it easier for them to be sanded out. I think this is going to be okay without a tab up here. We'll close that. I am going to ramp in my plunge move, the smooth ramp over the distance of an inch, and make sure I have sharp external corners. I do have a couple. And we'll call that cutout. And we'll calculate that tool path. I get the warning it's going to cut through the material, which is fine. I want it to. And we'll preview that tool path. And from here, it's a simple manner of cutting my tabs and then finishing just like any other woodworking project. So. Those are the steps involved in creating a wall clock, importing a DXF file, deciding which type of movement you want, deciding what size hands to get, what shaft diameter, shaft length, thread length, and style of movement you need. So that gives you a little bit of insight as to what it takes to create a wall clock from a DXF file and using a clock movement you have on hand. They're not limited to clocks. I like to make clocks. They're a lot of fun. But there are several other things that you can do with these state outlines. We have an absolute ball figuring out various V-carve projects. They make great gifts. Folks seem to love them. And you can have a lot of fun with them. So, I hope you got something out of this video. 
If you did, I do hope you'll give me a thumbs up. Now, as a reminder, this afternoon at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, I'll be hosting a live Q&A session right here on my YouTube channel where we can get into clock design, uh, sources of movements, hands, sizing, double-sided machining, anything that I've covered in this video. Again, that'll be today at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, right here on my YouTube channel, and I'll put a link to that live Q&A session down in the description box of this video. Also, I'll remind you that these DXF files of all 50 states plus the District of Columbia are available on my website, marklindsaycnc.com. So I hope to see you this afternoon for the live Q&A session. And as always, whether you subscribe to my channel or not, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time to watch, and y'all take care.